Start in Ukrainian. Доброго дня всім, хто дивиться нас. Hello to everyone watching us, following us. Today's panel is going to be in English, so please choose the English channel, the interpretation. We're very happy that you joined us for this part of our conference. So, hello everyone. My name is Julia. I'm an editor of the Commons Spielner Journal. And I'm so pleased to welcome you to the third panel of this year's conference, Intersections of the Peripheries. In spring of 2023, our editorial board initiated a project called Dialogues of the Peripheries. And this project aimed to foster meaningful critical conversation, transcending geopolitical boundaries and building solidarity with the communities in the so-called peripheries. Today's panel is centered around the questions of the climate crisis, resource extraction, imperial legacies and wars. All of those elements are deeply intertwined in our regions, places and geographies where the Western capitalist projects meet the Russian and Soviet modernities. And for this panel, we made a conscious decision to concentrate on our regions, mainly because the conversations about the so-called post-Soviet spaces are extremely missing from the global production of knowledge on climate crisis, environmental justice, and extractivism. And today we have speakers from um, Georgia, Sakartvelo, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine. And uh, let me just briefly introduce them. We have Ira Zomruyeva, who is an artist and cultural geographer researching the environmental and political history of central Ukraine's landscape change. We have Nikolas Tikridze, who is a paleoanthropologist and archaeologist. Um, Nikolas works as an assistant professor of Ilya State University. He's also a founder member of various environmental activist groups, such as the Green Feast, Green Policy Public Platform, a chairman and one of the founders of the Science, Education and Culture Workers Union of Georgia. Nicholas' research interests are the Stone Age archaeology, paleoanthropology, ecology, industrial pollution, green politics, and social movements, and labor rights, and many, many more. And we also have Aigrim Kabar, uh, who is uh, an interdependent curator, interdisciplinary researcher, decolonial and environmental practitioner based in Kazakhstan. Aigrim founded Artcom platform, which is a community-based contemporary art and public engagement organization. And also since 2020, Aigrim initiated ecological movement SOS Teldecom and project of care for the lake ecosystem of the Lake Balhash. Unfortunately, our four speaker, uh, Asel Dodkieva, could not join us today, but uh, it's very lovely to have you all and to have this conversation with you today. And um, so we will have 15, 20 minutes for the presentations, and then we'll have a discussion just to remind our audience that we have a Q&A session uh, and you can, just pose your question and I will read them afterwards. And uh, now I have a um, big, big privilege of passing the word to Irina Zimbruyeva. And yeah, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Can you see that okay? Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much, Yulia, for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for uh, spending some of your Sundays uh, here with us today. It's yeah, a great privilege to be in such conversation. Um, as a way of introduction, I wanted to say what I am not going to talk about first. So I will not be talking about climate change impacts in Ukraine, although these are massive and very much felt already. There is increasing droughts and heat extremes. Uh, we can take that in the Q&A. Uh, but I will also not be talking about Ukraine's contribution to climate change, which is also a significant one, or about how the war, uh, the ongoing war in Ukraine contributes to climate change. But instead, I would like to look at how 
Ukraine in its kind of semi-periphery uh, status, we can say, I guess, that has been tangled in Europe's attempt at tackling the climate crisis. And in that, look at how these attempts have uh, not only not resolved uh, uh, the climate crisis, but only perpetuated the land degradation that the war brings. And uh, this work is part of my wider research on the history of central Ukraine's uh, uh, landscapes. Uh, central Ukraine, uh, Krybovnitsky in particular, is where I come from. So those are the places that I'm interested in researching. It's This research is not based in any academic institution. It's something that I am doing independently. Um, so I will focus on some uh, more recent events, and then we'll try to show why it's important to see the continuity of harm uh, to the people, to the environment, to the land, and to the climate also, be it from the war or agrologistics. But I do want to start with more uh, recent events. So since the beginning of the full-scale war, uh, Russia has uh, hit a huge amount of uh, facilities. Uh, this is the map that you currently see on the screen from uh, Ecodazor uh, platform, who records and um, tracks basically the environmental uh, damage that come from the war. Uh, so as of uh, October 2024, Russia has hit, uh, hit more than 1,600 facilities, and that's what this, these impacts look like on the map. And of these facilities, uh, 350 are in the food and agriculture industry. Uh, now, Ukraine has around 30,000 of potentially hazardous facilities. What that means is pipes, oil storage tanks, nuclear plants, basically anything that can explode. And around uh, 3,000 of these are warehouses storing uh, highly toxic uh, agrochemicals uh, like pesticides. Uh, Ukraine's list of uh, state-approved pesticides include uh, more than 3,500 items, uh, with a number of them banned in the EU uh, because they can cause cancer in humans or cause severe damage to animals, birds or insects, uh, but are still perfectly legal in Ukraine. So if we come back to this map, uh, most you can see that the orange, uh, yeah, orange bits and dots uh, there are located in the active war zone, so the south and the east of Ukraine. So when we hear that Russia destroys another agriculture storage facility, um, it is not only grain or food that might be hit, but also toxic chemicals too. And the thing with pesticides that they're not destroyed easily with a missile shot. Uh, whatever remains after the attack, uh, the active ingredients of the chemicals uh, are leaking into the soils and the waters bring vast amounts of pollution and uh, contamination. So basically we have a situation where Russia's long distance precision missiles are turning Ukraine's agricultural storage facilities into their chemical weapons. In addition, obviously, to Russia wrecking cows and just yeah, doing horrendous things uh, on top of that. But if we are to think about the post-war regeneration in a serious way, we also need to take a longer view at how climate change and war and land use entangled because we did not end up with this mass amount of fertilizers overnight uh, in Ukraine. And the reasons for that are important to understand for the topic of our today's conversation. So there is still this kind of imaginary of Ukraine as a steppe region, so steppe are Ukraine's uh, native grasslands, and on many maps you can actually still uh, see the number of 40% referring to how much steppe we currently have, which is misleading, it comes from outdated visualizations of climatic zones, that speaks to the temperatures, the type of soils, and the kind of vegetation that naturally occurs there, uh, the kind of things that you can see on the my photographs that I took in July uh, back home. Uh, but in reality, the majority of land looks like the picture on the right. Uh, so the 60% of Ukraine is actually arable land. And uh, it means that it's not just any kind of arable land or not just any kind of agriculture, but we're talking about large scale commercial, export-oriented fields that dominate the uh, land use in Ukraine. Um, and there are some important numbers that I'd like to uh, point out here. 
so this is the vis visualization that I made uh, based on the Ukraine State Statistical Service uh, publication called Agriculture in Ukraine. So all of this is public public access, uh, where you can see which crops uh, dominate Ukrainian landscape currently. We have uh, basically the three largest ones: uh, sunflower, maize, and winter wheat, uh, all occupying more than five million hectares. Uh, closely followed by rapeseed and potatoes, uh, occupying around one, yeah, between one and two million of hectares. Um, so what this statistical publication offers is actually a reckoning with scale, because before Russia's full-scale invasion, we had five plants that occupied more than 20 million hectares of land in Ukraine. So we're talking about nearly 40% of entire countries occupied with five crops. And what growing five crops on more than 20 million hectares of land means is uh, several things. So first of all, that all five of them, except potato here, actually, because potato sometimes scores lower. It just that year it happened to be one of the top five, but actually often it's soybean that is also grown for export that is in the top five. Uh, so the, these top four currently on the slide, they are for export. That means they're grown to primarily satisfy international markets uh, and Ukraine's economic dependencies. Uh, the second thing is that crop rotation cycles and letting land rest is often not happening, which means the land is being exhausted and depleted of nutrients and its life-supporting capacity. And we have the studies that were carried out before the war that show that at the very least 10 million uh, of hectares of land, which is one third of all arable land in the country, is degraded, infertile with the signs of uh, desertification. And now we can only imagine what layering this with the war induced harm means for the place. And also forgot to mention that so these circles they're just to represent the scale they're obviously not where uh, the crops are actually located but that's just to illustrate the scale um but then coming back to the agrochemicals uh, uh, this consistently high yields uh, that uh, the companies that are growing them are able to harvest are only possible because of the high rates of fertilizers and pesticides used. So it's not a nice bonus, it's not slightly improving the harvest, it's completely dependent on the very, very large quantities of fertilizers and pesticides. So how come we ended up with such land use ratios? of most of the land uh, being used for export crops. It's not, again, it didn't happen overnight. It did not happen with Ukraine's uh, independence. It began with the onset of agriculture in the form that we know it today in the early uh, capitalist form of economy with the late Russian empire, then established itself properly during Soviet times, massively upscaled after the Second World War. And this is what we see continuing today. And of these five crops uh, that I mentioned, it's uh, mainly grains for bread and also oil crops. Um, but there is one that I want to use as the illustration of how, uh, I suppose you can call them technocratic attempts at addressing the climate crisis play out on the ground and also spotlight the power dynamics of the cores and some peripheries of capitalism. And this uh, plant is uh, rapeseed. Um, you can also know it as koza, canola, uh, raps, uh, ribak in Ukrainian. It's not as impressive in the territory that it occupies compared to the other plants or in tons of expert, but it's really the proportions and the purpose of its production that I want to focus on. So first of all, even though all of these export crops have very high rates of uh, export, so that means more than 50%, but rapeseed has the highest export rate. So 90 to 95 of the entire harvest goes to the EU. Um, it is, so rapeseed oil is one of the most common oils, cooking oils in the world, but Ukraine's rapeseed has very little to do with food actually, because uh, most of rapeseed goes for production of fuel, uh, biofuel or also called agrofuel uh, because rapeseed is uh, an oil crop that is suitable for turning uh, it into biodiesel for transportation. And so rapeseed harvest uh, becomes uh, a raw material supply for Europe's uh, supposed energy transition. And that's where things get very, very complicated. Um, or yeah, complicated is, is the wrong word, uh, difficult and unfair in many ways is probably a better way to describe that. So 
Here in the uh, graph on the right, uh, we can see there was a major spike in Ukraine's rapeseed production that happened in 2003 when EU adopted uh, what was called then a directive on biofuels and renewable fuels. What it uh, did, it set the targets for all of its member states of how much biofuel they were supposed to add to conventional uh, fossil fuel-based petroleum. De jure, uh, this directive aimed to reduce carbon dioxide emissions from transport, both in the industrial, commercial logistics, but also personal car uh, usage. Um, however, unsurprisingly, there was a lot of pushback from researchers, environmentalists, civic activists, civil society generally, for various reasons. For one, the land used solely for producing biofuel crops could instead be used for producing food. That's kind of the obvious one. The second is that rapeseed farming actually causes vast amounts of nitrous oxide to be released into the atmosphere. And that's a gas that is 300 times more severe uh, in causing global warming than carbon dioxide. And also on top of that, it depletes the ozone layer. All of those things were not part in the consideration of proposing using rapeseed as a biofuel. But essentially, and I, this is the most important point, is that the central promise of biofuels, uh, to which is to reduce fossil fuel use and greenhouse emissions more generally, it doesn't hold. The overview of EU energy statistics make it very clear that relying on monocrop plantations, be it rapeseed or palm oil or soy oil, to prevent climate collapse has not led to any significant decreases in fossil fuels over the past 30 years. And it takes some creative accountancy to claim that biofuel help avert climate collapse, but they all omit one crucial detail, which is the amount of land that it takes to produce them on and the amount of fertilizers and pesticides that are extremely climate impact, like they, yeah, they, they have huge climate impacts in producing. So all of that was not part of the story. And while EU tried to uh, regulate the sustainability of their biofuels, and Germany actually is now considering phasing out crop-based biofuels entirely, uh, some international organizations like FAO and United Nations Environmental Programme actually uh, make ongoing policy proposals to the Ukrainian government to introduce a mandatory share of biodiesel in diesel fuel at the level of 5%. And of course, uh, well, sadly, it's not a surprise that there is no concern in those proposals for how it's grown, who is growing it, at what land, and at whose cost. Um, and another very concerning piece of the uh, whole agrofuel puzzle is the fact that it takes hexane, um, which is a crude oil refinery product, to produce rapeseed oil. And actually, it's not unique to rapeseed production. It actually, every cooking oil that goes... Um, that goes through the refining process, everything that happens after it being cold pressed is using a solvent. And the solvent is hexane. So it's a petrochemical solvent that is still the most common solvent in the industry, used to extract oil, yeah, as I said, for cooking and fuel purposes alike. Uh, in the agrofuel, um, in the ag agricultural industry jargon, it's called processing aid. And it's stuck very far into the process that makes it very difficult to trace. And the parallel here I could give is um, how when we buy bread, there is no label uh, on the bread that yeast was used, if we buy sourdough bread, I guess. Um, similarly here, none of our oils say the hexane was used, but it was used if it wasn't cold pressed. So it's, yeah, it's, it, it's there, but it's kind of invisibilized through the ways that structures of supply chain operate in this economy. Uh, so yeah, no labels um, are included for this. Uh, and uh, despite being uh, produced from non-renewable fossil fuel resource, um, and it's been also proven as highly toxic to the environment, to the human health, it is still widely used in the production of world's most consumed seed oils, including, including rapeseed. And it's the same for the biofuels. And again, as you can imagine, these kind of knock-on effects that are hidden further down in the supply chain were not included into the whole advocacy of uh, climate change, uh, of rapeseed as this climate savior plan. Um, what happened eventually with this with this policy, it had many U-turns. Uh, eventually, it, the EU changed the policy internally 
so yeah, something entirely different applies for EU member states, but uh, the market for biofuel was already created. So it made sense for Ukrainian agriculturalists to ramp up its uh, production. And we can see that it remained kind of, it fluctuated up and down, but it remained quite high with nearly a million and a half of hectares of Ukraine's land being um, occupied with it uh, um, until today. And it's really important to also see what's happening uh, after the full scale war, because uh, the war has affected everyone in very different ways. And for some, it meant, of course, very horrendous consequences. But for some, it was still an opportunity to continue the extractivist uh, practices. So in 2022, uh, despite the beginning of the full scale war, Ukraine still sold three and a half million um, tons of rapeseed, which made the country third largest uh, rapeseed exporter in the world. And in 2023, so last year, the largest area to date was sown with rapeseed, so 1.4 million hectares. And it's not just the scale of the land, it's that pretty much all of it, 94%, was covered with almost 2 million ton of pestic pesticides, insecticides and herbicides. And here I'd like to quote Christina Planck, who is a brilliant political ecologist who was working a lot on what she calls the uh, rapeseed agrofuel project uh, and uh, has pointed out the complicity of both Western financial institutions and also Ukraine's oligarchs in driving injustice within land use in Ukraine, because it's not a simple situation where we can point fingers at those over there as guilty, but we need to understand this complicity in reproducing this extractive regime across the states and across the private and public institutions. Um, Another uh, thing coming back to the pesticides themselves, so the number that I mentioned uh, at the beginning of my presentation, the three and a half thousand uh, of pesticides, almost uh, 700 of them are used specifically for rapeseed to ensure basically no other creatures are around to damage the harvest. And we know also that uh, the agrochemical industry emerged from the World War II, that inst it, it instrumentalized the knowledge of what kills, basically. Uh, the knowledge that we have today of the pesticides is heavily reliant on the knowledge of the toxic chemicals that were used in gas chambers, for example, during the Second World War by the Nazi Germany. Um, and we have that playing out in a very complex, entangled way today with Russia's war in Ukraine, where chlorpicrine, uh, which is a chemical that Russia used in Ukraine as a chemical weapon, it is also a pesticide. It is not approved for use uh, in the EU, uh, for example, but in Ukraine, you can still buy it from two suppliers, even though it's not actually on the list of the state registered pesticides, but somehow you can still buy it and therefore put it into, into the soil and onto the crops. Um, another very commonly used uh, pesticide that originates uh, also in this post Second World War um, production is uh, diacloprid, which is one of the neonicotinoids. Uh, that is extremely toxic, not only in itself, but it further mutates to form chemicals that, that are a hundred more times more toxic than the original. And uh, here I want to quote the geographer Ani Shatuk, who reminds us that pesticides became essential not for producing enough food for, to feed the population, but for the survival of a particular form of a political economy. And this is my last slide where I want to share just a few kind of key key points uh, uh, from uh, from my talk. So I think what this this example for me is about is that the technocratic attempts at tackling the climate crisis can often replicate further injustices. It is true for rapeseed, but it also true for wind energy gener generation in many places and the questions of where the wind farms are located. Uh, we know today that despite the boom in renewables, the world is no closer to the Paris climate goals until fossil fuels actually decline drastically. So we have the creation of market for the fossil, uh, for the sorry, for the biofuels, for example, but the fossil fuels are not seeing any drastic declines needed to actually prevent more of the catastrophic climate change effects. Um, the second point that it's important to remember in this context that fossil fuels are what pays for Russia's war in Ukraine but also its early wars in Chechnya, in Sakartvelo, and in other places. Uh, fossil fuels are still the biggest contributor to Russia's economy, uh, predominantly its petroleum and gas. 
And as of today, Russia is a belligerent in five wars, including Ukraine. Others are Russia is still present in Syria, in Central African Republic, in Mali and Burkina Faso. And wars are expensive to sustain. And this, yeah, being reliant and extracting fossil fuels and having places that are willing to buy it makes those wars possible. The third point is that when once these wars are over, we are still dealing with the massive amount of toxicity. And this is what Ukrainian researcher Svetlana Matvienko calls or refers to as pollution uh, as Russia's weapon, or researcher Max Liberon calls it pollution as colonialism. And we need to also, yeah, basically take into account these very long-lasting changes that will be coming in contact with the climate-induced changes. And my last point is that while the dominance of agriculture uh, export crops in Ukraine is not a new trend, and we've seen this both within the late Russian Empire times, the Soviet times, and the independent Ukrainian times, um, but when we have this very ongoing active conversation about decolonization in Ukraine, I would like us to be able to see the uh, extractive agricultural practices as part of the colonial legacy that we need to move beyond and come uh, at much more healthier for humans and for other creatures alike ways of uh, living with each other. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this uh, incredibly touching and amazing presentation and was very informative, especially in times when our landscapes and lands are transformed not only by this very fast and acute violence of Russian bombs and troops, but also by the slower one, less visible Western neoliberal de developmental projects. And it's a yeah, very crucial conversation. How about the biofuel energy and rapeseed is just um, a very one of one of the one of the examples of how these extractions are conveyed now. And mm. uh, thank you so much for this. Thank and I'm passing the floor to Aigirin Kapar. Yeah, thank you so much uh, to having me today. I will continue also the stories about the extractive extractivism. And uh, the situation that's going on now uh, in Kazakhstan. Uh, and I will share my screen. Um, so, oh, sorry, sorry. It's not so. It's this one, right? Can you see this? Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, sorry, uh, I cannot see it, but all of you, you see it. Um, I mean, I'm not able to see the presentation. Maybe it's... I don't know. I will try to do it again. How about now? Mm. Oh, maybe it's my... I can see it fine. <laughs> I... Okay. If everyone can see the, the screen or the main screen, I don't know how it works. Okay, should I continue? Yes, yeah, sorry. The presentation is shown, therefore you can continue. Thank you. So, um, I'm from Artcom Platform. And uh, our mission is to practice contemporary art, engage and unite communities in a shared care for collective memory, culture and environment, and for sustainable futures of Central Asia. And we value diverse form practices, opportunities, experience of coming together and creating in our society. And we see art as a part of everyday life uh, that values initiative and interaction between people uh, from different communities and spheres. And uh, also we unlock the potential of art and knowledge production for social cultural transformation, environmental and climate justice. And one of our initiatives that they wanna focus today 
is a care for Balhash. Uh, we initiated this project uh, in 2020. Uh, and our mission is to engage communities and institutions in collective care for the ecosystem of the Lake Balhash Basin, exploring the history, culture, ecology, and production and production uh, local knowledge uh, for the sustainable future of the region. And uh, Balhash Lake is uh, 14th largest lake in the world, and today uh, located in central Kazakhstan. And today, the lake uh, facing uh, like environmental, social, economical, and climate challenges um, as a result of anthropogenic impact and uh, colonial politics uh, of uh, Soviet Union. Um, so there are several problematics that uh, why uh, well, Hash Lake endangered today, and according to the McKinsey Group, in 2046, the Lake Balhash will disappear uh, and will face the same scenario as the Ral Sea. Uh, the, the, the sea which was stolen by Soviet people uh, from Central Asia. And um, the one, like, I mean, the big, the biggest challenge is uh, climate change, and, and the, uh, because of the uh, uh, water, uh, the yeah, and the Balhash Lake uh, is um, is like it's located in central Kazakhstan, but uh, it's actually the basin of the lake. Is is transboundary, and uh, we connected to the Ile River with the with the China, uh, especially with the part of the uh, eastern Turkestan that now calls Xinjiang, and uh, eighty um, percent of the water uh, supplies to Balhash is from Ile River, and yeah, there is like uh, <clears throat> yeah, and around it's a red zone. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there is an ongoing uh, degradation of the land and also the uh, the risk for the biodiversity loss. <clears throat> uh, and uh, another challenge that we also have been since, I think, last year, it's a neo-colonial uh, of the Russia uh, since they and our government already like have a plan to build a nuclear power plant on the lake of the Balhash and since I'm also involved in um, anti-nuclear movement in Kazakhstan uh, we see that uh, there is like a, a visible interest of Russia also to be part of this like uh, uh, building the nuclear power plant to expand their uh, power in the region and control. Uh, okay. So um, our goals is strange are strange in the connection between local communities experts governmental, scientific, and cultural institutions. We do research on the environment, biodiversity, water, soil, and social cultural landscape of the region. We also engage local communities in the production of the knowledge and creation of social and environmental projects together. We as well raise public awareness about the challenges of the Lake Balhash through the organizations of the educational programs exhibitions, art interventions, uh, performances. Uh, we also inv uh, inform the public about local cultural heritage and ecological situation there through the educational program. And also for us, it's important to mention how we actually arrived uh, to the Lake Balhash. Uh, we arrived there through our uh, research-based practices, exhibitions and educational program. Uh, that aimed to like uh, to decolonize our own um, 
view on our history and also imagine our futures. In 2019, 2018, 17, we organized several projects, and one of them is Remembering Dialogues of Memories, Exhibition in Memory of Victims of Political Repressions. And through this project, we also um, understand for ourselves and did the commitment to care for the environmental and climate justice in Kazakhstan. Uh, on this um, image, uh, we can see this like uh, red figure. For example, it's a uh, it's approximately uh, the uh, the size of the uh, Sarshagan polygon that actually rented by Russia, and uh, it's uh, there. And uh, Lake Balkhash also uh, one of the uh, um, yeah, one of one of the like geopolitical um, important for the uh, it's it's actually represent a geopolitical position of Kazakhstan between China and Russia between two empires because the Lake Balkhash, uh, the Sarshagan Polygon, there is. Uh, played the role uh, is a shield of Russia against of the China, and uh, so as you as I mentioned before, it's also like a transboundary basin, and we share the river Ile with China, and uh, just uh, a month ago, uh, our government uh, released the referendum, and on this referendum that. Uh, People decide the, the the people of Kazakhstan decided to build a nuclear power plant on the Lake Balkhash, and uh, uh, and as we know that uh, Lake Balkhash itself now uh, in uh, in crisis, and uh, the, uh, it's like clearly that the nuclear power plant on the Lake Balkhash will kill the lake and the ecosystem and communities around. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. so we started the project uh, with the research. I did the research on the, about the cultural landscape of the Lake Balkhash. Uh, so we practice different uh, activities and project there uh, with the community. It's the interventions, walks, lectures discussions we do also publications uh, we organize several uh, exhibitions and uh, this one is uh, also as a part of the art collider school which is uh, was organized with uh, local youth uh, center um And also, um, we work mostly with the local communities because we, we believe that, uh, the first of all, the power of the uh, local communities is, is, is essential for the, uh, for the environment, climate, and other initiatives. So we also filmed and did a documentary about the lake. Uh, since uh, the one of the uh, one of the um, traumatic, uh, let's say, part past of the of the Kazakhstan of the collective memory, it's a genocide that also uh, happened during the Soviet Union time in 1920s and 1930s. Uh, more than half of the population uh, was killed by uh, the famine and uh, artificial famine. I mean, and especially around the Lake Balkhash, more than uh, 55,000 people uh, were murdered. And uh, it's also the part of the collective memory of the of the um, local communities around. And uh, we also see how um, how the like uh, how the colonial um, events also interwind with the with today's situation and how it's interconnected 
And uh, since like a uh, Balhash area by themselves, in, even in Kazakhstan, it's a gray, gray zone of ecological disaster, economical and social crisis. And mostly people in Kazakhstan do not aware about because the this territory around the Lake Balhash during the Soviet Union time were like erased also from the other part of Kazakhstan since this lake, uh, the, especially Balhash uh, city and the, all of these military uh, cities around the lake, it was like uh, directly uh, connected with the Moscow. And even, I mean, even today, if you want to travel to, to Balhash from different parts of the cities uh, of Kazakhstan, it's not easy because there is no direct connection. And uh, in, um, in 2000, uh, this year, actually, through, we also organized with my colleague uh, International Water and Climate Forum in Balhash city. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was it was uh, difficult to bring people there. And uh, since also 2000, oh no, sorry. Actually the city Balhash was built, uh, especially in the, uh, in 1920s, 1930s, because uh, the biggest uh, copper mining uh, factory was also, uh, Build there, and this actually was the reason to build the city around this uh, smelting uh, smelter, and also an extractivist copper mining industry. Uh, today, uh, and uh, what, uh, and today actually this mining uh, industry still impact uh, the life around, and. Um, <clears throat> And, and our goal for the for the forum uh, was uh, unite efforts of civil society, scientists, cultural figure, governmental organization, business, international community uh, to create a common plan uh, for the preservation of the Lake Balhash and sustainable development of the uh, of the region. And, um, and so we invited uh, for the forum. Be, uh, representatives of the central and local government, uh, industrial uh, enterprises, agriculture and be, agriculture and businesses, uh, also diplomatic missions, uh, activists, academic artists, and like public organizations. So, and we see uh, as a strategy is interdisciplinary and interconnections. So the ecology, climate, economy, water, communities, history, and culture, that was the themes of the forum. And uh, so we organized this for forum with uh, my colleagues and we work on that uh, also with our government, uh, with the uh, like key, key stakeholders and um, so we achieved some results of the forum so we created this network of the partners uh, we also uh, like uh, discussed on the joint action plan that also was uh, developed and created by the experts that we invited um, what um uh, Yeah, and uh, um, what actually, as a, what I can also share as an impact of the forum, it was that uh, the main, um, the main uh, stakeholder business uh, businesses also joined uh, the our um, initiative, and uh, not only our initiative, but they actually uh, joined the. To this like uh, work uh, and care for the Lake Balhash and just like I think it was uh, two days ago at COP in Azerbaijan uh, Kazakh Mills uh, Corporation mining corporation, uh, corporation uh, who are owned this uh, copper smelter in Balhash city and not only uh, so with our Ministry of Water Resources they organize site event and just um, I think yesterday they also uh, published some announcement that they will um, um, continue 
uh, work for the preservation of the lake. Uh, also, they announced that they will invest uh, millions of millions to uh, to protect the lake. Uh, so this is also we also as a as a part of the as a part of the forum we also organized international exhibition, um, interviewing uh, water clients. Uh, and communities and there is like uh, some uh, works that uh, were created by the artist and especially this one is a uh, commission work by Magulmin Libaeva. it's a Balhash tribute to the waters of Central Asia Kazakhstan we also uh, exhibited the work of Ho which uh, talk about the uh, the tragedy of the Aral Sea and also other international artists that uh, shared about this about the uh, imagination of the climate future of the migration of the uh, animals and other non-human species Hadimali and uh, we also uh, happy that we were able to share the work of our um, Friends, artists from Indonesia. Uh, it's a family forest. They shared how they care for the for the land, for the community, and for the uh, climate uh, through artistic uh, practices. And this project by Dilara Kaipova. It's a uh, pachta uh, cotton. Uh, it's uh, the, from the whole series of the Great Cotton Road. Uh, who works actually talk about uh, also the uh, one of the uh, colonial instrument of the Soviet Union that uh, the, the agricultural one and this industrialization that uh, actually the Central Asia suffers. Uh, today it's uh, about uh, the cotton uh, industry uh, that uh, needs a lot of water and it's actually invasive uh, plan that was um, invented during the Soviet Union time. It also the cost of this uh, cotton uh, industry is actually Actually, Dalsi, uh, did also by Hatak Midyarov and uh, this uh, work, uh, famine by Umar Keldabi of his uh, local artist uh, from Balhash, and he uh, he created this work uh, about uh, the famine uh, in Balhash in 1930s. Uh, yeah, and. We also uh, care about the uh, regional situation with uh, the water, climate, and communities. And uh, this is a video by Mutabar um, from Uzbekistan, from the Kazlar Collective. It's about the water scarcity in Uzbekistan. And uh, <clears throat> This work uh, by Saida Tabekov, the artist from Shumkent. And this is the legend of the Great Step. Uh, it's about like uh, about the all of the uh, stories that happened uh, in in the Great Step uh, through the through the through the years of. Uh, uh, colonization, resistance, and we still life practice have uh, still continue our work for uh, our work uh, for the sustainable uh, region. So I think I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, again, for this uh, amazing presentation and for shedding light to this new colonial practices of both Russia and China, those two intersecting imperial formations that are still having impact on, on Kazakhstan and on Central Asia. And thank you, of course, for your activism and curatorial practice uh, and all the, everything that you do to preserve the like, local ecosystem of the Lake Balkhash and um, 
the nuclear advocacy uh, you're also making and it's uh, a very it's a double pleasure to have you with us um, especially considering how busy you are with with all of your um, practices and all your work and um, so yeah very glad to have you and to to have the central asian perspective present at the conference and now i'm passing the floor to nicholas to hear more about the hello everyone do you see the the presentation yes yes okay so i will talk uh, today briefly about um, uh, the industrial pollution uh, in georgia which is uh, related to the extraction of the natural resources and uh, briefly i wanted to show that uh, uh, the, the practice is really harmful and it could be uh, better than, than, than it is uh, so yes uh, so uh, i will start with uh, i wanted to tell uh, I'll, uh, tell you about um, i mean a little a little story about what is happening now in georgia Let's start that in uh, during the collapse of Soviet Union, mostly at the end of the uh, Soviet Union. So uh, these environmental movements were mostly, you know, nationalist and uh, uh, conservative in nature, but uh, there were also some other um, politicians uh, which tried to build up the Green Party and so on, but uh, finally they were absorbed by the uh, pro-capitalist um, governmental <laughs> autocratic parties, unfortunately all of them. So in the beginning of this century we started uh, new movements. Uh, which was one of them was Green Feast, and uh, then we we uh, there there were uh, groups like uh, Young Greens, uh, and uh, now there are also other groups. They call themselves Greens too. Uh, but uh, what was the problem that uh, when we were fighting against this uh, uh, um, pollution and economic? Uh, uh, politics, which was quite uh, brutal and um, uh, vandalic, let's say, because uh, uh, like it, it was uh, uh, focused on the extraction of these resources, and uh, uh, it was uh, like quite uh, neoliberal. They were like just selling everything, <laughs> as in other post-Soviet countries, uh, and um, so. Uh, we saw that we needed some kind of scientific uh, proof, scientific evidence uh, to, to demonstrate what is happening. Like, okay, we understand that uh, uh, there is pollution, but government all, always uh, uh, talking about this is not true and you cannot prove it. So we needed uh, to politicize the science. And that's because uh, I mean, some of my colleagues and friends, we decided to start um, uh, uh, to research and study the, the pollution. And uh, afterwards, we were able to see its uh, economic um, uh, um, harms to the uh, to, um, to our country and the people, but from the different uh, perspective. So uh, the environ environmental impact of the extractive uh, pollution is uh, quite uh, in, in modern uh, era, so I will not go deep in, in this direction, but you know also, I, unfortunately, I have here some Georgian writings, but I, uh, I wanted to translate. <laughs> but anyway, I, I'm talking here about how human health is affected by, by this um, pollution. Uh, there are some uh, elements like uh, manganese on lead, uh, cadmium and uh, um, other type uh, uh, heavy metals, which are really, really harmful to our um, uh, health. So, and uh, mostly here in Georgia, we, in everywhere, let's say, we have en environmental agents and bodies of mining pollution. So, some of them, they are agents and uh, also they are bodies of the contamination, but also they transfer the, these uh, contaminants and the pollutants to, to the other bodies like soil and um, 
water. Uh, yes. So uh, uh, Georgia has. Uh, we are not rich with um, with such resources, but it's enough to for <coughs> for some oligarchs to be rich. So uh, and mostly all those companies are related with uh, international companies, Russian companies like this. Uh, uh, in um, southern Georgia, uh, there's a um, uh, huge company, Rich Metal Groups, which is Russian uh, company, and uh, they are um, they started uh, like the, the the extraction of the gold and other heavy metals in uh, in uh, southern Georgia started in the 70s, but uh, the last um, uh, 20 years already uh, the the, the the mining was uh, enlarged and the grow, uh, uh, like it is growing uh, uh, really much and uh, all, all those activities of course are affecting the environment uh, and uh, the people the pu public uh, uh, involvement and participation in decision making does not exist <laughs> it's it's just uh, you know theater and um, uh, so um, one of the most uh, uh, one of the activities which is mostly uh, in, in the in Kazreti, which is uh, southern Georgia, uh, pollutes the, the environment is uh, is a blasting. It's uh, uh, blasting um, uh, activities uh, uh, which generates dust, and uh, the the dust is full of the uh, heavy metals. So uh, it is, uh, and the area is covered by these uh, pollutants. We have another. Uh, like, mm, source of um, uh, pollution uh, leakage and the leaching of the pollutants into the, into the rivers uh, you see here uh, it's it's uh, rivers around the Kazreti uh, RMG um, uh, extraction around that RMG uh, licensed territories so you can easily see that there is a <laughs> High, uh, high pollution, but government was uh, always uh, negating. I mean, they were just uh, refusing the fact. So that's because we started the, the research. Uh, and um, this is the an another um, uh, part of Georgia. It's Imereti, it's near Kutaisi, more or less in the central uh, uh, western Georgia. It's Chiatura, where uh, the company GMG uh, is um, extracting manganese. And also, they have uh, they have many uh, factories which are uh, under contractors. I mean, uh, they are not uh, directly connected to the uh, company, but uh, in reality, they they are part of the company. So uh, all of them, they are like you can see easily how high is the pollution. Uh, and uh, yeah, there are many problems uh, related to the uh, waste rock. Uh, which is also one of the source of uh, sources of the um, pollution, and uh, uh, the the territory is quite large. And uh, like uh, after, this is the picture of 2018, and uh, at the moment it's because uh, excuse me, are not seeing the PowerPoint, so it's not showing the images. Oh. So I just wanted to oh. to really? focus. <laughs> Wait, wait. The, um... I, I thought. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah, now I see it. Yeah, now, 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 now we. See now, it. now you see. Yes. Can you see now? It's. Yes. Oh, okay. It's just stuck sorry, on one sorry. slide. It was just stuck on one slide. Maybe you can um do the um, showcase. Yeah. If I do. If now you, you see. You just, uh, yeah, if you just move uh, move it, then we can see all of the slides. Ah, because yeah, okay. This is, uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry. I, I thought you, you you see that. Uh, okay, this is the uh, dust generated uh, by the mine blasting, uh, which is one of the source of the uh, pollution. You have here the leakage and the leaching, which is uh, quite, uh, um, I mean, Quite often it happens, and it is uh, at the moment 
the situation is is uh, is bet uh, we have better situation but it uh, i will explain why so and uh, also you have such a like this is already in uh, in western georgia and you see how uh, rivers are polluted here like dark matter enters in, in the in a normal river and it changed the color so this dark color is uh, uh, it, it 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 flows maybe uh, 20 even more kilometers uh, and uh, we have also problems with the mining waste uh, uh, stockpiles where uh, which is also uh, uh, quite dangerous and uh, one of the sources of the pollution so this is the uh, the, the uh, licensed territories uh, it's quite you know, quite huge you can see the carriers and different uh, mines uh, but at the moment, it is um, uh, quite enlarged than, than, than you see here. And uh, that's, uh, that's why we decided to, to take uh, as, uh, the samples as much as we could. Because uh, before, there were some uh, uh, researches which were not accepted uh, by the government. But this was uh, one of the hugest research because we, we took many samples from uh, soil samples and uh, also the water samples around 60 so uh, it was quite uh, and in the research we involved all the uh, local institutions uh, we could like from the um, university of um, Tbilisi State University and there were also involved some uh, some private uh, laboratories so we used the atomic absorp uh, absorption spectrometry, which was conducted in, in several uh, insti uh, research institutes uh, and uh, the private institutes. And uh, we demonstrated that uh, the, the, the pollution was so high, you can see it, uh, even contrast is so high between 2014 to 2017. So it's it's uh, it's huge. I mean, and it it, uh, it exceeds the the, the maximum uh, permittable. I mean, the, the concentration quite. I mean, a thousand times you can imagine. Uh, you can see the the pollution with the lead and um, uh, also the uh, this spatial distribution of the. Uh, uh, pollution. This, this is uh, cadmium, which is one of the most uh, harmful um, metals, <laughs> uh, and uh, it's uh, quite uh, uh, it's uh, distributed over all of these territories. And uh, uh, we are trying now to more or less um, start some uh, research of the public health because we we, we don't know the uh, what, what is the situation. Uh, and but uh, after this, uh, we uh, when we published our work, so government and the company they started, you know, the comp company against us that we are like uh, it's a trick, it's not true. So and but we involved uh, most of the scientists which we, which are locally working on the matter. So we tried to politicize the scientific information, not just to say that this is uh, like we have here like lead and that's all, but it was politically already uh, uh, already active. And uh, uh, we, we entered in a parliamentary committee and uh, from the parliament, we were able to push the, uh, the government and the, uh, the company to start the mitigation, uh, 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 to, to implement mitigation measures. So uh, at the moment, everything is uh, stopped because I left the committee because the government changed totally. In two uh, after 2020, it was impossible to collaborate with the government because they took the autocracy um, uh, turn. So they are going uh, in, during uh, towards the total uh, autocratic um, uh, rule. So. Uh, I decided to. It is useless to work them because if you uh, have a like one step uh, forward, then you have uh, several steps back. <laughs> unfortunately, so. But uh, we were able uh, with these um, uh, steps and procedures that we, we we try to push the government and politicize the science and the scientific evidence. Uh, 
so uh, the, the, the company uh, started this uh, implementation of mitigation uh, measures. So they were just building some kind of uh, uh, cleaning uh, facilities, pumping systems, and so on. And it was really uh, working. I mean, it was uh, working because we were uh, monitoring all, all, all this uh, uh, time like from 2018 to 2021 we were more or less able to monitor it but uh, after when we saw that it is useless because the uh, the the chair of the uh, committee was changed uh, it was changed two, two times so the, the last uh, chair she she's uh, I mean with, with her we can we could not uh, we uh, have a dialogue She's too strict. So, and as as a whole government, she was like part of uh, the process of the autocratic uh, autocratic turn of the uh, government. So we were able to uh, to push them, and they were they built some uh, cleaning facilities of the uh, of. Uh, 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 water cleaning facilities, uh, but now, uh, uh, as I know, they have some problems with it because uh, no one monitors it because the uh, ministry is uh, lacks uh, all these attributes uh, to to control the process. So, and they, they are totally obedient uh, obedient to the government. So you see now uh, the this is the another uh, map, uh, and it demonstrates that uh, uh, almost. Uh, it is twice uh, big as it was, uh, as I showed you before, uh, the, the same uh, map. So it they are opening new carriers and new uh, mines, and it will be really, really disastrous for the uh, for the region in this situation where they do not have uh, real um, uh, mechanisms to mitigate the the the, uh, the impact on the on the environment. And uh, also, we try to make another um, uh, uh, research in uh, Giatura, which is in Imereti, in near Kutaisi. Uh, so, but we were not able to um, cover all the problems. Uh, I mean, the um, uh, pollution and degradation of the soil. But we we concentrated in in this case on the uh, pollution of the rivers because all these uh, uh, little factors. They 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 pollute uh, river pretty much, and uh, we, we we went there and we took uh, quite uh, a lot of um, uh, samples. Uh, you see the the, the river is quite <laughs> um, black. Uh, we we involved there also some different uh, institutes of uh, of the Tbilisi State University. Uh, to compare the results, and all the, all all those results are are, the, are similar, and uh, like in the in the rivers of of Chiatura, we have uh, like uh, concentration which is uh, which exceeds uh, uh, like nine hundred times or thirty eight times or ten times, which is quite high. But uh, also, it depends, you know, how much you, you, you fight. If you fight more and if the, if the local population uh, supports you, then there is a more or less high possibility that government will uh, uh, implement some mitigating or push the company to, to start. So we tried, but they, they, they did only this, that from the river they took some really valuable resources. It, it's not because they wanted to clean the river, but it, it was just a theatrical, you know, the, the scene to, to demonstrate that we are trying to implement some mitigation, clean the river uh, valley, but uh, generally uh, they were able also extract some valuable resources from it. Uh, so, uh, but uh, what, what I wanted to, uh, to, to explain and uh, show my, uh, uh, position, I mean, uh, the perspective. Uh, 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 if you take the modern environmental principles of mining, everything is based on the maximum re reduction of the uh, mining, uh, we process, downcycle, dispose, and uh, then totally uh, use the, 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 the materials to not uh, 
uh, lose them. And uh, it's one of the uh, interesting uh, quote is that today's waste, tomorrow's resources. So it means that maybe you do not have today the, the technological, you are not developed or you do not have technology to extract and use all of these uh, materials you have in a, in a waste. So you, you stockpile them and uh, mostly in Georgia, unfortunately, they just throw it. But it is uh, um, profit profitable. I mean, and uh, so uh, you you should uh, um, save the this uh, this uh, so-called waste because tomorrow maybe you uh, you develop a, a technology with which you can extract those uh, resources from the uh, from the so-called waste. But that's because. Uh, uh, I, I wanted to show you that, uh, like here, we lose a lot of cadmium. We lose, uh, as I showed you, it's uh, uh, the concentration exceeds uh, minimum permeable um, uh, uh, the, the range from uh, thousand times. So if you use the, sorry, if, if you use the cadmium in production, you can produce uh, uh, cadmium telluride uh, detectors batteries, uh, solar cells, or uh, use it in, uh, or sell it for the, uh, to, 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 uh, to invest in the control roads of the nuclear uh, reactor. But uh, unfortunately here in Georgia, we have quite a contradictory, uh, contradictive, I mean, uh, uh, the, the code of the, the for the extraction uh, generally. So uh, here I have, unfortunately, this Georgian, but I will explain that if you want to, uh, uh, sorry, uh, if you want to, uh, wait, why is, why is, uh, extract the cadmium and pro, uh, so for one uh, tone, you should pay uh, uh, around uh, eight, 800,000 dollars, which is, uh, you know, crazy. <laughs> no one will uh, extract this uh, cadmium for such money. So I don't know why they put um, such a taxation on, on, the, on this resource, but uh, generally what I wanted to uh, explain that we are losing the profitable resources because there are, we do not try to uh, understand uh, the extraction is a is a is a complex process. It's not a just uh, you take the, the the resource and you sell it and you have profit. No, it's a, it's connected to the uh, general uh, uh, concept of the of, of to be a human. So to be part of the nature, to change it, but uh, uh, to be alive. <laughs> To explain it's easier. So I, I, I will uh, uh, call um, Karl Marx's concept of metabolic rift. So uh, uh, it's uh, it's about uh, the, the concept is based that uh, before the development of new technologies, uh, the metabolism was a natural process. I mean, it was recycling. Uh, it was uh, recycling. Uh, it was possible to recycle everything. So uh, the humans, they were working. Uh, their technology was uh, developed as much as they needed. The resources uh, were produced and the naturally recycled. But after, you know, this uh, agricultural and technological revolutions, it became more and more impossible to control the process. So, uh, and in a capitalist society, uh, and uh, mostly in a, in a post-Soviet countries where uh, the, the turn towards the you know uh, independence took uh, took um, I mean uh, the flow it, it opened I mean possibilities for some oligarchs uh, to to extract everything they want but do not share it and uh, mostly uh, if you take uh, most developed, I mean, um, developing countries, you see the same. And uh, what we see now is that uh, the uh, the metabolic rift is quite uh, um, uh, it's quite huge because of the climate change, uh, because of uh, non-degradable and unrecyclable uh, materials, 
and uh, the, the overgrowth and overconsumption. So what what we produce, it, it's, it cannot be returned. So it means that we are really near to the crisis, crisis of this metabolic rift when you you will not able, humans will, uh, will not be able to metabolize the, the resources. It means that uh, they are going towards the crisis uh, from where there is only one, um, uh, one solution or option to to overcome all these uh, problems. It's it's cha you should change your economic uh, model of the of thinking or economic uh, paradigm. Other ways we are going towards the extinct extinction. Uh, so and uh, here uh, it's, it's last slide. So I wanted to show you that uh, the. Uh, how how it's uh, it is enlarging, growing uh, the production, but uh, but uh, uh, the uh, uh, the Earth's crust is exhausted. So it means that when when uh, the uh, you know these uh, uh, these resources are not uh, risk, uh, like uh, let's say uh, any more uh, uh, sustainable. So. It means we are losing everything, which which should be used after uh, by new generations. So, unfortunately, what I see in Georgia, uh, the step by step, Georgia will lose all of its resources, and the, the unfortunately the oligarchs they will uh, find, <laughs> I mean, they will be more rich and rich, and then the society will will be. Uh, poor and poor uh, become poor poorer and poorer and so uh, we are now trying uh, to continue this fight using scientific evidence more and more but you know with the new law we, we call it Russian law but it's about the agents and all, all of us all the people who, who fights against the system and tries to change uh, the, this this uh, grave situation they are becoming agents, as in Russia. So, so the push from the Russia and uh, the, the international capital is really strong. It, I'm not talking about only Russia. Of course, Russian companies are trying to push the Georgia and uh, the Georgian uh, oligarchs, which were which are controlling everything here. Like some years ago, two years ago, they just sell two percent of Georgia to one uh, oligarch. So without. Uh, uh, consulting the people <laughs> and uh, finally the protest uh, there was a huge protest that they, they, they were obliged to step back uh, there are several other protests where uh, were able to win but finally they are trying to uh, to uh, to change uh, everything towards this uh, autocratic uh, system and uh, the this different kind of uh, uh, international capital and investors they try to to be part of it unfortunately thank you i think i, I finished uh, thank you so much for, for this uh, super informative uh, presentation and uh, all uh, solidarity and power to you in in your very multi-faced um, well fight and uh, yeah, um, thank you for the perspective. Uh, thank you for invitation. <laughs> I hope it was uh, I explained. Uh, I mean, well, to 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 show what what we are doing. It's uh, a bit. Uh, I tried to be short as I could, but. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, no, super interesting. And uh, um, well, I, I don't know if I can speak for the whole spiel, but uh, for us, uh, it's also very important uh, to keep the knowledge politicized and, and activism driven. And it's amazing to see people doing this uh, all across our regions and all across the world. And um, yeah, also we see this intersections uh, between um, our context and how they are being well framed as a territory to then be easily um, extracted from and uh, I think that's 
might be a good point to move to the discussion. And uh, firstly, I would really, uh, I'd like to remind our audience that they can pose questions if they um, didn't do this earlier. Uh, and I would like to start the discussion with maybe shortly uh, you reflecting on each other's presentation so we can bridge this connections theme. Ira? Yeah, uh -huh. I'm happy to go first. I think I had the longest uh, time to to think. I'm just, yeah, I'm so impressed with both of your work, I agree, and Nicholas, and I think it's just as such a, you both, with the people that you work with, make something that otherwise would be invisible, visible, and that's such a huge part of what we're doing, right? It's not just kind of like fighting something, it's kind of articulating what that is, articulating what is the toxicity, what is the harm, what is the extraction, what is going on here. Um, and actually, I wanted to ask, like, my, my comment is less of a comment, but more for a, a, a question, because I would love to understand a little bit more from both of you what your thoughts are on this kind of the tactics that you choose in your work, because it, it can vary, right? This kind of work can be more like collaborative coalition building knowledge production all the way to something that is more like direct action, like blocking the minds and kind of going and doing something that is extremely disruptive. And I wonder what your thoughts are on kind of how you consciously or not choose which which one you uh, pursue. And I personally, I was involved a bit in the more of this direct action-y uh, anti-mining activism when I was living in Germany for a while. Uh, and that was unfortunately a very effective tactics that I saw there. Um, and in Ukraine also, we have more of that happening with some of the ski resorts being built or like the attempts to build ski resorts in the middle of Carpathian mountains and kind of a way to resist that is not just in the policy space, but actually in going and occupying the place, which is very important. And I uh, had yet yeah, to also more like specific questions. Yeah, I agree. I would love to hear more about this because you said the with the nuclear power plant being built, if you could say maybe a bit more about how, what was the conversation, I assume it's a governmental project or if it's a private one, what was the narrative around it, kind of how was that position, did most people really support it, because you did say it was a referendum, but how from your perspective, the arguments for that played out and whether anything about nuclear waste and like storing the nuclear waste, like where is that in the story, that would be great to hear. Um, and Nicholas, the question I wanted to ask you is about how did you, because I find it so fascinating how you managed to build it, all of these coalitions of other scientists and push for this like very political approach to resolving, uh, well, trying to resolve some of these issues, I guess. Did you manage to build any support in the communities that this was happening in? Or kind of how did you bring or not bring any of them on board? And the reason like I have like a, a lot of interest in this is thinking about the agriculture in Ukraine, where with so many of these uh, big firms having be like the main employer or like the only employer in town. And therefore, there is kind of resisting that means also being out of a job and there's all of these dependencies. So there are some people who are protesting, of course, against like this highly toxic pesticides, this large scale farming. But it's it's a very, very difficult thing to be protesting against. So some thoughts on that would be fantastic. Yeah, um, thank you so much for the for the comments and uh, for the question. Um, so, um, to from my observation for the like uh, for some years that I uh, observe also was, um, involved in the process of the voting system like a referendum of course i mean if also if also important to remember that uh, soviet union they did like more than 40 years of nuclear testing in kazakhstan and we affected in impacted by nuclear uh, tests for the 40 years and the, the, the issue is still not solved and uh, of course like people in kazakhstan they are not happy with the nuclear power plant of course but you know 
these systems like of the vote system, they can write anything with what they want to. And also that was the huge massive propaganda for the nuclear power. And also me as a, as a like a, uh, as a um, specialist in public relation, I clearly see that this is the propaganda goes through the from the Ross Atom, which is the which is the the company of the of Russian company that actually have this like uh, uh, attitude uh, also like building the nuclear power stations around the world. So and they also building this like uh, already, like it was announced that the Rosatom will build nuclear power plant in Uzbekistan. The similar situation now going on in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, so I mean, decision there, yeah, and as we know, the uh, for now it's not clear who will be uh, uh, companies who will build the nuclear power plant. Um, so the our government have this idea that it will be like international coalitions, like uh, different international companies will involve. To, will be involved uh, so but uh, for sure i mean we see that there is the lobby for rosatom like so active and uh yeah but also there is some hope because as we know like nuclear power plants like mostly could build in 10 15 10, 20 years who knows and i think now for that time the lake valhash will be already disappear so i'm not sure that they will be able to build nuclear power plant with the climatic situation yeah if they will not like you know like push the all of the efforts to save the lake not to destroy them yes uh, thank you for your questions uh, yes, it's uh, quite, we have not uh, a quite difficult situation because uh, at the moment some scientists we were working, they are not anymore involved in uh, in it because, you know, <coughs> people, the society is exhausted. I mean, here we have many problems and uh, uh, what the, the, the system tries is that um, it uh, it creates the environment when uh, where people, they are, uh, they are really, I mean, alone. They have no uh, options to avoid some this some kind of economic obstacles. So they are closing these people. Like it's like, I mean, in, in these industrial uh, towns, uh, we have the situation where you cannot like just uh, extract yourself from this matrix. I mean, it's uh, uh, the system uh, pushes you. It's it's a kind of oppressive and. Uh, uh, and uh, quite um, ignorant uh, system. The, what I wanted to say that uh, these companies, which are quite rich and they are, they have huge profit. They do not spend anything in in the region, in the town. So you cannot reinvest the the the. Uh, they are not reinvesting the money in different kind of the uh, different kind of businesses. What means that all these towns they are uh, totally dependent to this extraction. So and uh, unfortunately, it is quite difficult to work because, like me myself and my my some colleagues, we also are part of the uh, trade unions, and uh, for us also it's quite difficult because. Uh, uh, people are, you know, society is, uh, is, um, uh, let's say, exhausted. So they, and we, uh, with the scientific arguments, you, uh, more or less it works. You can ev awaken uh, the society, but finally, uh, always uh, in, in many directions, like, I mean, uh, there are some other protests where you, you do not have such kind of, uh, matrix and political matrix like uh, we were uh, we were involved also in the fight against some huge dams and around dams there are you know uh, different uh, situation there is a di different environment which is not controlled by the the, the company 
company and the government. But here uh, in, in these towns, uh, this, uh, the government and the uh, companies, they are intermingled. I mean, they are working as a symbiosis. So it's quite difficult to, to, to fight them. But we tried, we tried, and there are also, of course, people which, uh, with which we can, we have some, uh, we had some presentations, we explained and so on. But uh, it's it's quite a little part of the of whole population. So I, uh, I hope uh, <laughs> one day we will be able to uh, gather all of them and uh, create uh, a, a stronger. Uh, resistance uh, uh, movements than, than we have now. But more or less, uh, uh, we saw that the, if scientists are involved and they are explaining uh, uh, in a scientific way this, uh, those problems, then then people, they understand much more than, than without just shouting and talking from the, I mean, uh, pure uh, uh, political or... Uh, uh, activist agenda you know <laughs> so that's because uh, i think uh, we were able to to start to uh, uh, to to build some kind of relations but it's it's just the beginning and uh, i hope that we will be able to uh, overcome this uh, crisis we have in in georgia we have huge crisis uh, i mean maybe you know also because we our government is totally um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, autocratic and uh, even it's it's despotic. I mean, <laughs> and uh, there is a uh, there is a last uh, I mean last uh, important um, hope that we will be able to crush them <laughs> and continue uh, uh, working towards the more, more democratic society. It doesn't mean what I want is I'm is a uh, left wing uh, socialist green. So uh, for me, this is also not uh, <laughs> not the acceptable uh, environment uh, politically, but more or less we are able to exist and uh, develop our ideas. But in uh, in the next uh, year, if uh, next uh, few years, we, we will be crushed if they continue this if they were able to maintain the, the the government the power thank you i get him yeah thank you so much yeah thank you nicholas i can uh, i can relate uh all the the all of the issues that you are sharing because yeah, I also was uh, wonder, uh, wondering how you are working with the local communities because the, the project that you're doing as a scientist, as a researcher, so you're doing is like kind of full scale, also on into like a kind of practice based and also with the impact that your research, not just as a paper, not only the knowledge, but it also involved to enter the political activism. And it's, uh, I think this is the, uh, uh, as I as I see also through my uh, like work with my colleagues and experts and scientists that this is the only way and also in collaboration with the local communities because it's a power and uh, but empowering of the local communities it's also big questions because as we know it's like a, uh, like in the in that area is as like around uh, the world, not only in Kazakhstan or in Georgia or all in Ukraine, the local communities there more and like less powered, and they need like more um, also like efforts to do something. And also, I actually I have the question for the uh, for Irina, and like uh, thank you for sharing because I think. Um, this is also like this narrative of the of the like full scale war in Ukraine, and when like and and this is like a, a, a huge and massive um, uh, ongoing um, like a huge and massive ongoing uh, murder that happening now, and also like how like how the actually the attention of the local communities. To the to the problem and issues that you are sharing in, in terms of the agriculture, climate, food secrecy, and etc. How how it's actually achieving by the local communities? Uh, yeah, should I respond first and then Nicholas? Yes. So yeah, 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 yeah. This is an excellent question. I um I think I tend to agree with what how uh. 
there's Natalia Mamonova, who is a brilliant scholar also on Ukraine's like agriculture, who says that if it wasn't for the war, the issue of the land reform would probably have been the biggest issue in the society. So I didn't have the time to mention this in the presentation, but that's uh, uh, no news for the Ukrainians in the audience, uh, but uh, Ukraine had for 19 years since the independence uh, a moratorium on land sales, uh, and it was cancelled by Zelensky government in 2021, which means Ukraine officially now opened land market, making land available for sales. And that like evoked, there was a huge amount of conversations. There was like lots of protests, lots of debates around that, lots of like all of these um uh, because, of course, there was no legislative mechanism to prevent further monopolization or concentration of land in one hand. So it was like a super big ongoing um, debate, uh, including around food sovereignty. Also, food sovereignty is not really the term that is used. It's kind of a thing that is practiced in some shape or form because most of the food that is produced for internal consumption in Ukraine is actually produced by small scale farmers, uh, medium small scale farmers. Uh, and it is the large scale uh, foreign, but also local oligarchic ones that are doing all of the export. Um, yeah, so it was like a super ongoing like conversation, but the war definitely like cut that. Uh, yeah, because people had to focus on more things like survival. Uh, but the government, uh, there was some initial talk that the land reform should be uh, paused or stopped uh, when uh, the full-scale invasion just started, but it was just a conversation. It all continued the same way, so kind of we have like this, yeah, insane like aggression happening from Russia's side, but in parallel, the government is opening land market, and of course, it's who is able to sell what land, who is able to buy that, and of course, people who are in the active war zones who are act actually actively affected by it and have to flee there in an entirely different position than the headquarters of some international firm that is able to uh, put in the bids for the auctions. So it, it's a very scary situation from my uh, perspective. There is still an incredible amount of, um, it's way smaller than I would love that to be, but there is some kind of, there are some coalitions of peasant farmers, uh, there are some unions, but it's all quite small and is uh, yeah hugely affected by the war but also at the same time it is exactly those small scale networks uh, of food producers that were able to make sure that people didn't starve <laughs> because it was yeah that kind of knowledge the connections between people and communities so it's uh, the, the war I guess affected everyone in very very different ways and we also guess shouldn't forget that some of these large companies that own by now like vast amounts of land or control or have them at least formal or not, they have themselves now established demining units. So if you are a farmer, like in Mykolaiv Oblast, yeah, you are now having uh, the land that is deoccupied, but Russians still have left a lot of mines behind. And we have like ongoing, like constant reports of like someone like, yeah, uh, suffering from like exploding on them, but the big companies are able to hire people who can clear the fields for them. So the ability to deal with the consequences of that also really scattered and uneven, of course, uh, um, but that was a long rambly answer, but hopefully that <laughs> gives some sense of some some things that are happening. Oh, sorry, I have I have to mention, of course, I how could I forget that there is a lot of so I talked mostly about agricultural land things, but there is a huge amount of um, environmental NGOs like Ukrainian Nature Conservation Group, for example, who throughout all of this full scale war have been going and taking samples in the like ongoing war areas, trying to actually track down how much pollution is happening so there's no kind of full um, estimates of how bad things are now but it's because of these kind of like activity and your driven research that we actually have a sense of like the toxicity that Russia is leaving behind so just a shout out to the cool work that uh, UNCG is doing but Nicholas yeah. I'll pass on to you now we'll hear from Nicholas and then I will have uh, the last question for you from the comment comment section uh, and we have 15 minutes left for the discussion so just uh, to say. yes I, I just uh, wanted to ask something then then uh, in uh, Q&A I, I saw the the the, the, uh, the um, uh, question from Carolina and it was the same I wanted to <laughs> ask so it's uh, uh, and uh, it's quite important to understand the, the more uh, globally the, uh, um, the problem 
because here mostly our um, there are uh, around 10 uh, movements different movements uh, left wing movements and green movements in georgia but mostly we are isolated from the i mean uh, from uh, from the global uh, um, uh, let's say global fight or uh, global problems uh, because we have our our own uh, important problems which uh, which should be or overcome and uh, then we can may, maybe we will be able to and that's why i me personally like for me european perspective it does not mean that i want i i like you european union's uh, political establishment but uh, i i feel that there are people uh, which uh, share my opinions and uh, there are people who fights in the uh, the european union if, if it is i mean the, if there there we have the, the the social states it's because uh, the left wing uh, movements they were fighting quite a lot uh, to uh, to to resave this i mean to to have this uh, um, uh, this result but anyway now uh, 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 there is a uh, happening in Europe and uh, uh, here in Georgia. We, we try, of course, but it's not uh, enough. And also on the regional uh, scale, we, like, we try to communicate with Armenians, but we, we have no time because we have our, uh, our own uh, fi um, um, struggles in each country. But I think the, the, the what what uh, could be the, the possibility to overcome and the, the uh, refresh uh, the, the the movements uh each uh, it, it should be the, such kind of uh, international uh communication but it should be on the basis of the practice not uh, on the theory but like i i like to share my uh, share we should think about the practice i mean how how we can practically to uh, uh uh, practically support each other and uh, maybe new uh, energies from the countries like uh, we are uh, can uh, in in and like uh, the the western or, or even uh, north or south south america it does not matter but i mean uh, the, the changes of this um, practices may be uh, may may is vital to to uh, renovate the process i mean I, uh, this is my uh, this is uh, just it's, it's a question also what what can we do i mean in your opinion in um, so that's that's uh, the, the, this uh, this is uh, the same quite same as carolina asked just a few uh, minutes ago thank you uh yeah i will just Lastly, vocalize the question because uh, people on Facebook do not see the, do not see it and do not understand the context. So Carolina asks uh, every speaker, "How do you think the environmental agenda differs between Western Europe and North America? Very much of the ecological knowledge, and where where much of the ecological knowledge and research originates." in the so-called post-Soviet regions. What aspects of the Western discourse concepts can we adopt and what can we challenge? That's the question that Nicholas was answering uh, to. And so would you like to uh, reflect on this? Mm, I can start. Mm -hmm. So actually, like I'm, um, I'm speaking from the UK now because I just uh, started my MA program at Essex University, uh, Environment, Culture, and Society, um, and like I'm a bit uh, disappointed. Also, it's not that I was I wasn't disappointed before. <laughs> no, it's not just like. But still, I mean, this is like it's every day what I'm facing, like all of the theories, like research, mostly done by like white privileged people without reflecting like what they have done, mostly like without the critique or like uh, examples, study cases from the other regions not uh, western europe or like uh, northern america and so on 
and um, so what I'm thinking about, like this is also like when I'm when I'm going through all this like ideas, I can't really like um, recognize my uh, situation there. Yeah, and even like uh, and what I think of what uh, what could should we do in terms of to more pay attention for ourselves to the to the regions from where the knowledge comes, not uh, centrated uh, in uh, the places as uh, North America and um, Western Europe and. We also, for example, if we're talking, speaking from the climate position, I mean, this all the industrialization and all of the costs that we are paying now, it comes from these places, right? And uh, yeah, and the cause of the of the wars that also going on around, it's also like uh, like these people, these countries, these uh, governments, like politician, it's actually also from there and. Yeah, maybe there is something to adopt, uh, but I think we still like somehow like everything that we read about ecology, like in, in theoretical, like we always like even like I don't know, uh, Nicholas today also was like reference to the to the some people, and you, we can open their their names; they will be from that places with white uh, imaginations. Yeah, and and what we can do, yeah, we can use this as a tool, but also like find a way to develop our own like ideas concept practices and make this dialogue more diverse because from only that point of view we will not be able uh, to build more like uh, justly organized uh, anything thank you yeah yeah i think um it's when we think about Kind of yeah, the, this the question of knowledge of like environmental knowledge and where it is. I think it's very important that we don't slide into this perception that there is this environmental knowledge that exists over there, and we over here are playing a catch-up game with the West to learn about our environments. I think that's been a big challenge for me, having had um, like I have I studied ecology back in Ukraine uh, in Kiev but I do have a master's degree from Germany by a curriculum that was much more shaped by this kind of like Western ideas. But since I did my master's like 10 years ago, I'm, I am I have been returning to try to find our own Ukrainian thinkers who have so much to offer uh, in how we comprehend our relationships with the environment. So I think for me, the, the big part of that answer is like looking at one another. And I think, uh, yeah, Yulia, who is our moderator today, but she's also an amazing researcher from whom I learned so much about Paraska Plitka Horetsvit, who was a Ukrainian photographer. And Yulia writes about her as the kind of eco-feminist or kind of the woman who kind of had a very uh, close, very intimate relationship with her environment. And from there, we can draw so much about how she with this kind of, uh, uh, yeah, in her own uh, context thought about the environment. So for me, I think it's this very precious thing to find out about such people whom also Soviet Union, of course, erased. Uh, that was part of all of the repressions uh, of the 1930s and kind of like uncovering those and learning with those is very important. Um, but that is, of course, not to say that we shouldn't learn from uh, from others. Uh, I think if we're talking about like Northern or just Americas, uh, what we call Americas today, it's definitely the indigenous uh, people who have a very politicized knowledge of the land struggles, what Nichols was talking about. So because I did study like political ecology in, in my master's and that I think very closely aligned with how uh, indigenous struggles would articulate the issues with colonialism, but it's not a matter of some kind of change in the language or getting rid of some monuments or renaming some streets. It is the land back. It is a redistribution of power and resources. And I think we could learn much more uh, from those who are in that much more kind of political headspace and understanding the nature of environmental conflicts because it's not just about the ecology and the economy and the society somehow no 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 we have a capitalist economy that rolls through the extraction and kind of politicizing ecological knowledge i think is yeah the biggest biggest thing that we need to be doing i'll stop there 
Uh, thank you everyone for this uh, amazing discussion. Um, just wanted to very shortly also highlight something that Nicholas was saying in the about uh, about the like it's hard to also kind of ignore the fact that now there is a climate conference in 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 Baku and all the problematics around it and um, hopefully in the next year we'll also have someone joining from Armenia and hearing the Armenian perspective in the current situation is also super important. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for this amazing, uh, truly inspiring discussion and uh, for joining us. It was a true pleasure for, for us to have you and to finally have these conversations. Hopefully they will be continuing. And also I uh, just wanted to say a big, big thank you for all of our interpreters, uh, for Dasha, for Maxim, for putting all of the work uh, together and for making the conference possible. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful moderation. Thank you so much for, for, you. for Nicholas and for Agrim to coming and making this time to come and to share uh, your context and your knowledge, uh, which is super precious for us. And Ira. Thank you very much for invitation. <laughs> it was really interesting. Mm, I learned so much just in the past two hours. Yeah, thank you so, so much. Thank you.